Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Hi. I'm your host today. I'm Francis. I uh, haven't been an um, MC for many, many years, so uh, a bit nervous here. But uh, I thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, if you are not uh, here to kill time in a Saturday afternoon, I assume that you care about social innovation or you care about education. Thank you so much. So uh, sincere thanks. But uh, uh, we need more Hong Kong people to care about the issue. So uh, billions of dollars has been invested into education uh, for many, many years. Uh, thanks for joining here as well. But I think, uh, but I don't feel that parents or students are happy. We talked about happier society. Are we building a system that we can make more happier students today or tomorrow? Or uh, we still have a lot of problems. Are we building a, a fair ground now for Kieran's information, many families, kids living under seven square meters in, or 10 square meters, even in Hong Kong? So there are a lot of lacking behind uh, special needs uh, with the children. So, uh, but those privileged, I can see that many friends are still uh, getting their kids rushing for on to boarding school as soon as possible. Why is that? We are investing a lot already. So I think that's something we want to talk about today. Um, but many people feel depressed, but uh, many people start doing something. Today we have, we have a series of um, talks today, getting a lot of change, change makers on stage. One of those, of course, Kiran. Thank you uh, for coming here all the way from India. So I've heard about Kiran for, uh, for a long time, big fan of DFC. So I think I would call her a serial uh, education innovator. <laughs> so uh, um, keep on doing a lot of things. I like capturing people. So I, before on the stage, I asked Kiran, what's one line that you can summarize um, on education or your dream about future of uh, learning and things? Uh, if you hear about that, you can go. <laughs> After that. Uh, she said, we only have today and not tomorrow. So I think we desperately need to do something today. Kids are growing every day that I can feel. My kids are growing. So I think we only have today to talk about this. So I think uh, with no more uh, delay, I think uh, let me introduce Mrs. Kiran Beer Sati on the stage. Please give her a big hand. Thank you, Francis, and uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, like he said, if we're here on a Saturday afternoon, then we must really care for this. <laughs> so thank you uh, so much. Um, well, um, I'm always going to start with my claim to fame. I come from the land of Gandhi. So Gandhi had this to say about either a happier society or about innovation. He said this. He said, if we have to have a real war against war, and if we have to have a real chance at peace, we have to start with our children. And that's really at the heart of this conversation. We keep talking about you know, the future and should we have a happier society and <clears throat> whether we should have schools that shape the future of our children. But there is a, f a tiny flaw in that argument, the idea of the future of education and the future of children. Because I have never believed that children are our future, that one day, they're magically going to grow up to be you know, empathetic citizens of the world and make the world a better place because they're here today. And sometimes we keep forgetting about the power in our children. So I want to remind you of this particular power. <laughs> You see, in the first two years of a child's life on this planet, anywhere in the world, 
they go from sitting to standing to walking to talking to thinking to laughing to pretty much telling all of us, look at me, I can. And just when they tell you that, what do we do? We send them to school. And then we tell them, oh, oh, sorry, you can? No, 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 that's the wrong answer. So we get them to sit when they are six years of age. And we tell them, you will only listen to what we have to tell you. And then when they are 10, we tell them, no, 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 we will solve your problems. You just have to study, right? And then we tell them to just worry about themselves when they're 14. Just when they are like Hillary, understanding the world and saying, can I do something about it? We say, no, 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 that's the wrong answer. You have to listen to what we have to tell you for 15 years. And then the worst of it all, we tell them that their success is a result of their grades. And we tell them all that you are just markable. You are not remarkable. And then we wonder why, why our children are not creative, empathetic, collaborative, innovators for the world. Well, look at the current scenario that we're talking about, just like what Francis said about education. And this, let me tell you, is not just in Hong Kong, uh, Francis. This is the world over. We, the world struggles with this either or conversation in, in education. Either we have a one size fits all, test heavy, uh, uh, you know, program where everybody tells you no, or we have the other side. Oh, everybody's singing and dancing the whole time and sleeping and singing nursery rhymes where everybody's afraid to tell you no, right? Shouldn't the purpose of education be this? That every child graduates with content and character, doing good and doing well, with finding their passions and compassion, right? So, for the last 17 years, when I started the Riverside School in 2001, this was the quest that I was on. Well, because hope was not your strategy. We couldn't one day magically believe that, okay, this has all happened. So for the last 17 years, we've been using design thinking principles, the principles that get the user to be at the heart of the learning program, right? And we've created this kind of like, we, call, we like to call it like a formula, superhero formula. It's a recipe, a framework, whatever it is. But the idea is, is to intentionally get our children from being just from human to humane. And the four E's that make us humane literally are the feel, imagine, do, and share. So it starts with feeling, it starts with empathy. The idea of getting children to observe their world and understand that they are here because of the other. The other is imagination, to get them to brainstorm solutions for what a preferred scenario might look like. And then the do, the action, the implementing, the act of change. And then finally, my favorite, share, to tell the story of change, to inspire others to say, I can. So this is at the heart of design thinking. This is the heart of what we call the new DNA of the human. So I would like to just show you two examples of how what happens when a child gets this I can mindset. When children understand that we are not helpless, change is possible, and I can drive it. The first are my youngest children, all of six. Actually, they were five years when they did it. The idea was for them to show their superpower of passion. Now, these five-year-olds decided to create and design homemade or handmade jewelry to raise funds for their older buddies that worked with children who had cancer. So in all of this, they learn, of course, their math, their science, and their language. But the one thing they're telling all of us adults is that age has nothing to do with competency. This is their story. Could we have the sound a little higher? Ajna Ma'am is a jewelry designer, and she has put up her jewelry exhibition. Then we thought that we could also make this kind of jewelry. Then we told Kiran Ma'am about it. Kiran Ma'am told us that you can do an exhibition. Yeah. Oh, Are you sure? sure? Yeah. <laughs> so, we said yes, but Kiran ma'am asked us that no, you can't do it, you can't do it. <laughs> but we said no, we can't do it. So she told in 10 days, I want five jewelry pieces. So we started looking at different materials and we created our jewelry. But when uh, we did the exhibition, Kiran ma'am didn't like our jewelry pieces. <laughs> Look at the size of these beads, right? And look at your pattern. Why can't I wear it? It's too tight. 
also we did a survey and asked different teachers which color do you want uh, where where you will use it in the second exhibition we got lots of advance orders <laughs> but when the ma'am started uh, using the jewelry pieces uh, the, the anklets broke so then we were looking at quality uh, and we went to the shops uh, we were comparing and we understood what was quality we went to nid what kind of tools they used to design or what material they use we thought that we can help heal by selling our jewelry then we had made many design lots and lots of jewelry pieces so we put up a stall in an exhibition at rajpat club customers were not believing that we uh, we have made this jewelry so this is what i told you about the power of our children at the at the age of 5 and 6 they have all the ingredients to be the change right and once a child experiences being the change they are forever changed The second story I'm going to talk to you about my oldest children and showcasing the superpower of compassion. Uh, for two hours every week, they go and work with children who uh, have uh, pediatric cancer. And though their interactions, of course, bring a lot of smiles and joy, the one thing they're learning is you cannot change somebody's life without it changing your own. This is their story. key stage 3 one of the main ideas that we are understanding is the idea of persistence our persistence idea is called heal where we work with children suffering from cancer when i saw that a child had a tumor in his eye that image truly bothered me a lot and that stuck with me and that changed me So now that we knew what really bothered us we formed a core team and we started working towards that. So we wanted to achieve three aims. One was the smiles which we wanted to see smiles on the children's faces. Second was distraction because they go through pains through those drips and injections that go inside their body every single day. We wanted these little tiny moments, happy moments in for them in their life third was transformation because their ward is very dull they have cartoons with no heads so what we did was we wanted to decorate and make the space more brighter with their own work which they they could see every day in their ward the moment we are entering they all, they were all come they were enjoying and they would smile and they would laugh and even the parents would for that for that much of time they would be relaxed and they would sit back and just watch their child happy and that's what even the parents liked about he abhi yahan aate hain to yahan bachon ko khilata hai bahut acha lagta hai do din ka zindagi hi sahi hai magar bachcha acha se khel kood ke to apna zindagi bitaye mera naam mohammad sarug hai mera accident ho gaya tha rickshaw se aur mujhe cancer ki gaad ho gayi thi pair mein koi nahi aaya jab tak aad mahine se hu hai yahan par ab tak koi nahi aaya pehli baar aayi hu we wanted to persist with this idea for even longer time and one of the main things that was restricting us was the finance the best way to raise some funds was to finally put up an auction we adolescents are very quick to change our mind change our interests change our passions but i guess one thing we've truly learned is that change takes time in an education you cannot teach children to be happy they have to believe it and live it so of course we had parents who saying wow making good children good human beings yay very good what about the mad science in english well the children were telling us this that their sense of well-being de- uh, completely uh, aligned to their doing well so when children are doing good they do well 
for the last 14 years, Riverside children have been outperforming the top 10 schools in India in your math, science, and English. Now that we knew this worked, we said, my God, the world has to have this particular formula. So in 2009, we designed and launched Design for Change. And then we gave the world and all these children one simple challenge. We said, take one idea, choose one week, and change a billion lives. And it has been phenomenal. Today, children in over 60 countries, over 2 million children, have been using the feel, imagine, do, share to change the bad and make it good with the power of their ideas. Right from stopping bullying, we have a, an organization here, from caring for the elderly, uh, from stopping child marriage to you know, uh, saving tribal culture, they have been using the FIDS to tackle some of their wickedest challenges. In fact, right here in Hong Kong, uh, since starting in 2011, we've had uh, 120 stories of change, 60 schools have been empowered, 500 students and around 790 teachers. So I'm going to show you just one story from Hong Kong. Five-year-olds who went to a uh, home for the elderly and realized that they were feeling very sad. And so they decided to change that story and give them happiness. Look at all the field section, the empathy. So they simulated each of those experiences. So today, the world was waking up to these new superheroes, right? So forget about Batman, Superman, and Spider-Man. Today, we had these new superheroes telling us that they can. So we had 11-year-old Ganesh from uh, India, who had his parents send them to school for the first time. Nine-year-old from Anita from Bhutan, who built a fence around the school so that children would not roll down uh, the hill. We had 13-year-old Juan from Colombia, who was able to preserve the tribal language of the Inga language. This is what the world needs today, right? Children who are inspired and ready to be innovators of change. And the story doesn't end here. In 2019, Design for Change is taking 4,000 children to be hosted by the Vatican uh, to tell the world that we don't have to be rich or strong or even 18 to make the world a better place. So this is what I've learned, that if we have to get a generation of innovators, it will not happen by chance. It will have to happen by design. So, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Unfortunately, most ministers of education today are so consumed with science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and having higher test scores that they forget that at the end of the day, if we don't have people of good character, people who do the right thing, intellect in itself will destroy the world it will not save it. So here's to design for change.
namaste, and shishi. <laughs> Thank you, Kiran. Uh, I'm always curious about um, how maybe 500 years later, how human beings will look back and see how the system today, how we create leaders in the education system today. I think it will be quite interesting. But I think um, while we are depressing, uh, let's all remember we have people like Kiran and many change makers. Uh, we are trying hard to make a difference. So I think no matter what, I think in these uh, 17 years, I think what uh, Kiran feel about the ups and downs, I think more important is not just um, decoding one solution. I think what she achieved is provide us with one word, I would say, it's hope. I think we can still make a difference. I think I can, it's not just for the kid, I think it's for all of us. So thank you very much for Kiran's inspiring <laughs> sections. So later on, I think coming up there will be four more persons, local flavor, uh, for us to taste about how is Hong Kong like. But I, I think all of them, you will get um, a lot of inspirations from them as well. Uh, first of all, uh, I would introduce uh, John Zheng. Actually, he needs no introduction. <laughs> um, he's been our uh, financial secretary for 10 years, um, spending on the budget on education for a long time. But uh, uh, right now, um, after elections, I always joking that uh, we are happy that he's not been selected. Because right now, he's now committing a lot in the community, especially on education, Esperanza. Uh, John, please share with us what we would do uh, with education today. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Karen. Uh, I, I really enjoy what you, what you have said, and I, I totally agree with uh, a lot of the principles that you have uh, been able to articulate. So I'm not going to say any more about education. I think you have said enough, and I think we, we should stick with that. But rather than that, I think I'd like to give you a, a, uh, a more macro perspective of what we are doing now, now nowadays. Because we are now in the cusp of a massive transformation. A transformation that is un unprecedented. A, a, pres a, a transformation that we have not seen before. From the economic perspective, we are trying to normalize we're trying to normalize after 10 years of abnorm abnormality, <clears throat> 10 years based on artificial stimulation, a lot of QE, and now the chicken is coming home to roost. So now with interest rates rising, uh, uh, with a lot, a lot of the, the, the liquidity cutting short and so forth, we are creating a different sort of problem that has never been seen before. Uh, so. And, and, and for a lot of the, uh, the countries, a lot of the economies, particularly the developing economies, with a lot of US dollar debts, they are going to find it difficult as interest rates begin to rise to repay those debts. And that's going to create a lot of problems in a lot of these other places. So we just note that. On the political front, we see a number of populist sort of crazy leaders around the world. Uh, and that is creating a lot of really random things that are difficult to, to, to predict. Populists, by definition, have no ideology. They just pursue their whims. And they do crazy things around. Uh, but what they are doing now, which is quite worrying, is destroying the multilateral system in the world, which has been able to bring about uh, some improvement uh, in, in, the, in the poverty level around the world. And that is something that may not be able to, to be repaired in the future. So we really need to take note of that. And on the social front, we see that people around the world now are losing faith, are losing their trust in the major institutions in, in our society from uh, government to major enterprises, even the media. Many trust indicators around the world saying that that has been on the decline and this past year has been massive. And they're looking more and more to civic organizations to, for leadership to bring about changes. And you all, I think everybody here today, 
I think we are going to be in a very important position to bring about changes that would make a difference in, in, in this world. But then against this background, what we see now is that people are living longer. People are living longer, and that is a good thing. It's a good indication of, uh, of, of better medical treatment, uh, better conditions in the world. But at the same time, we're also creating issues that we have not seen before. Uh, the pensions people have been saving up, is that going to be enough for them? If, if not, will the government be able to sustain them in the future? Uh, and, and then, of course, there are, you know, there are health issues, there are housing issues, and so forth for, 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 the, old, for, for the much older people. And then with fewer working people, that support ratio has, will go down in 10, 15 years. And will, are we going to have enough to sustain that? Or do we need to do something else to sort of empower the older people to, to create more initiative for the future? So people say that maybe technology can resolve all of these issues, perhaps to some degree. Uh, but as we know, in another decade or two, some 80% of the current jobs are going to vanish. So we are going to be looking at a wholly different world. But obviously, new jobs will come about, but they would require new skills. Where do we get these skills? Obviously, through education. But the current education system around the world was built, was made up, the curriculum was made up based on an industrial model of the 19th century. And we have teachers, they were trained in the 20th century to try to prepare the future in the 21st century. So we see a lot of disjunctures in, in, our, in, in, in that kind of scenario. So we, we, we need to effect a lot of these changes. How, we need to go from different angles to do that. How are we doing that? I think we need everybody's effort. And that's where we came in, 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 in a way, the, we decided that we need to, to build a platform, and Esperanza was, fo was formed. It was only founded a couple of months ago. Uh, we want to ultimately build a platform where we could build communities of like-minded people, kindred spirits, so that we can work on different areas that people will be interested in, so we can link them all together, working collaboratively, with compassion so that we can make changes. And that is the basis of that. In hopefully in a week or so, uh, we'll have our website going and hopefully people would sign on and we can get a network of people, like-minded people, so that we can push this matter forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Join. I can see that maybe Esperanza can be uh, an orchestra we need different people to play in different roles. So maybe join can be a facilitator to help us to um, orchestrating our instruments together to play a good play. So next up uh, would be Mr. David Fong. Apart from being a very successful business pe pe person, I think he also committed a lot of his time in higher education, public services, and um, consultations. But lately, I heard about um, the big little thing that uh, he committed a lot. So I'll let him to talk more about how he and he his corporate is committed to the society. Thank you. Thank you, Francis, for your introduction. I think uh, we spent a minute talking about the speed of decision making. You know, as an in individual, we can make a decis decisions like just like that, and we can probably solve some of our own personal problem. When you go into a group where there's a problem that the group needs to solve, there's a lot of deliberations, there's a lot of gifts and take, there's a lot of compromise depending on the complexity of the problems and the group dynamics, and decision making becomes longer. Now, it comes to a social problem, a social issues, and when it gets so big, and gets the attention of the government, when the government takes on the problems, there's going to be likely to be you know, public consultation, policy formulations, 
Sometimes it goes through the legislature. Sometimes it goes to uh, getting the budgets, getting the finance done. And then there's a cross-departmental type of bureaucracy. Implementing a policy is not so easy. And that's why a lot of citizens are getting very impatient. You know, how come uh, a problem like that takes so long? But, but that's the process. And, and being a big organization, you know, there, there's this governance, transparency, and all that uh, that needs to be in place. Uh, that is understandable. Uh, take the housing issue, a case in point. In Hong Kong, due to the very extreme high housing cost, a lot of the underprivileged, the old, has to live in subdivided flats. Uh, subdivided flats is like maybe a 400 square foot units where five or six occupants will live there sharing a kitchen, sharing a bathroom in a probably 50 years old or above housing units uh, without elevators uh, infested by insects, rest, fleas, and the like. And the hygienic condition is really unhabitable. But, you know, given their income, that's what they are forced to live, live there and paying rent like five to seven hundred dollars a month. And uh, moreover, other than the insects and all that problems, they don't have the money to pay for electricity bills to have air condition. A lot of times, given Hong Kong high humidity and high temperature situation, sometimes the unit's temperature goes up to 35 and above. So they really have to wander out of the unit during the very you know, hot days. The government is aggressively trying to address the problems uh, in building public housings and also recently proposed to landfill the 1,700 hectares island, which is about 1,700 football fields. But it's li likely to take about 12 years or more to finish. And many elders just cannot wait. Seeing the problems from the business sector, we decided to take the problems and tackle it in our own hands while waiting for the government to do more public housings. Our Hong Kong Foundation, a think tank in Hong Kong, established a platform called Business for Social Goods. As the name suggested, we gather a group of major companies and CEOs trying to share information about Hong Kong social issues and trying to come up with solutions. And then the Business for Social Goods come up with a pilot scheme called Big Little Things. And I took on the first pilot project trying to bring out an expensive solution to the subdivided housing unit problems of heats and insect infestation. We visited the site, we worked with the NGOs and the occupier there at first doubtfully thinking that, oh, another typical visit, but nothing will be done. So we I took the uh, we we asked the occupier what's the problems and all that. We took the problems back to the office. I tell my staff that within one week we need an affordable solution to make the person live happier, sleep better, eat better. So within a week, uh, the team you know works out you know, cross ventilation f fans, uh, flea powders, and and et cetera, et cetera. So in a week, we took our solution back to this unit and do you know, the, our installation. And after that week, we go back and then ask the occupier you know, the feedback and really got the smile from his face that he told us that he did sleep better, eat better, and, uh, and the cost to this solution is only like 500 US dollars. While he's waiting for a public housing units, we can do something as a business community, you know, to make his life better in the interim. So the next step, we are trying to scale this thing up. Hopefully more corporates can take up many of these social issues. And we decided to 
you know, own this issue, commit our resources, leverage our network, and our know-how, you know, to solve this uh, how subdivided housing units problem, which we call big little things. And uh, maybe, maybe I'll come show the video uh, to see what, what we did in that.政府策动企业发挥创意夏天不愿意留在家里協成行團隊計劃令更多湯房護受惠將製作改裝套裝讓義工或住戶按部就班自行安裝 conclusion instead of waiting for something perfect or big to happen corporation can take ownership to some of societal's problem tackle them fast like SWAT teams and take advantage of their expertise resources and network this bottom up approach is fast non-bureaucratic, and impactful. With a proven solution and benefits, NGOs and government become less risk averse and can move forward with to its tackle the big problems. This fast track solution can work hand in hand with governments and NGOs in resolving prickly societal problems. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Um, I heard that uh, if the colleagues cannot find the solutions within a week, they will be fired, right? <laughs> <laughs> you said that last time. So, uh, but I think I can see increasingly more corporate uh, would like to do more, uh, apart from just paying tax and go. So I think that's a great trend. Um, I would say, um, also I'll take the chance to thank uh, Jane Lee and also a couple of different friends uh, in the ecosystem to promote this trend on social enterprise, on social enterprise and social innovations in the last 10 years. So I would say right now, compared to other Asian, Asian countries, we are more um, um, uh, having a good ecosystem in promoting social innovation to everyone. So I would say right now, there are many more corporate who would like to contribute in doing social good. If you are a change maker, a social enterprise, think about how to leverage this new trend. So I think uh, the time has come. So try to leverage it more. Uh, as a good audience, I would see that uh, there will be many more um, questions coming up instead of answers. So if you have questions, you do have a chance later on after um, two more speakers We have a little panel here. So just to remind you to log on Slido s l i d o dot com so that uh, put your questions over there So we will address that later on uh, during our panel. Uh, so next up uh, it will be Andy Choi of uh, um, Bully Escape, right? Uh, Bully Escape is the organizations. So thank you very much. Please come here. So uh, he's a young guy but I, I can promise you that uh, we, uh, the organizer didn't uh, organize the sequence according to age. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like that. But I think uh, um, Andy definitely, <laughs> yeah. So it, you are. The, so I, I say it's not as in the sequence. <laughs> but thank you, Andy. So I'll let him to talk about uh, one of the issues on bullying. Uh, before the sections actually clear and say that uh, bullying is one big questions, uh, big uh, big issue that we have. Uh, um, not putting enough attentions in, but it is uh, creating a big um, uh, problem, actually way forward in our future. So
So I'll let Andrew to introduce more. Thank you very much. Hello all, my name is Andy, and I'm one of the co-founders of Bully Escape. It's my honor to be here to share to you what about we do at Bully Escape. So without further ado, let me talk about Bully Escape. The idea of Bully Escape started back in summer 2017. My and my co-founders and I were all from the same school, and we were invited to participate a camp which was organized by the science program. It is called Young Social Change Maker Camp. So um, we had an introduction on what social innovation is. And we visited various social enterprises and were exposed to various social issues in Hong Kong. And in the end, we had a chance to brainstorm our social innovation among ourselves. And that's where everything started. We officially kicked off Bully Escape in December 2017 and successfully obtained our prototype funding to test out our idea through SIE Fund in 2018. So, what, ex what exactly is Bully Escape? It is a social innovation that happens in an experiential center setting for teenagers where they will experience the typical types of bullying and hear about the feelings the victims might have. In the end, we will wrap up with a discussion with the social workers in understanding the impacts and consequences of bullying. In sum, through this 40-minute experiential activity, we aim to raise teenagers' awareness on school bullying and hope that we can alleviate this behavior and possibly encourage the bystanders to stand up for the victims in the long run. You may be interested why we chose this area of focus. The reason is that my team are also teenagers ourselves witnessed and encountered lot of, lots of bullying in our daily school life. In the form of... Um, in the form of cyberbullying, physical bullying, and verbal bullying, etc. It is so typical that it doesn't matter if it is a boys' school, girls' school, or a co-ed school. It is just a very typical thing that happens in school. And as you can see in the research, that was conducted in 2017. 32.5% of 5,000 students who were interviewed has disclosed that they have been bullied in the past month. And this is the highest in the world. As I recall one incident that I witnessed, I was informed for my classmates was being conned. For those who aren't familiar with this, it is a tradition where a specific student will be carried and be cornered to a pole or a door or something that can go in between her, his or her crouch. There's no specific reason why they do this. January is for fun. Not only this may hurt your crouch, and in this specific incident, the victim fell accidentally and bumped his head on the floor. In the end, he ended up going to the hospital with a bleeding head. Until now, Many students still think this is fun and entertaining, but they underestimated how damaging and serious this can get. Students nowadays don't really seem to be aware of the different difference between playing and bullying. Moreover, when victims appeal to, uh, to their parents and teachers about, about the bullying that they had encountered, parents and teachers will only take it as a, as a trivial matter. But I want to let you know that it can end up being a childhood trauma. And as we learn more about school bullying, Taiwan, Taiwan, Macau, or some, other or some of other countries actually have laws and regulations on school bullying. But in our homeland, Hong Kong doesn't have any. And this is also one of the reasons why we want to start Bully Escape as we want to cover this gap. In addition, and as a student ourselves, we often have to attend lectures to learn, but oftentimes this style might not fit all. And to me, it is quite boring. So, for me, if I can choose to attend a lecture on school bullying or going to an experiential cent center, I would definitely choose the latter one. Another benefit for an experiential center is that it can really enhance the participants' awareness of the impact and consequences of bullying through the first-hand experience. The activity will be held into five different rooms. Each of them carries um, their specific theme and activity related to bully. In each room, participants will be asked to complete different missions in order to, to get into the next room. But like I said, each room has a specific, specific, specific theme, so they may experience 
experience physical bullying such as being pushed around around while delivering a ping pong ball across the room, etc. You might also have to play in a maze where you need to find treasures that shall give you hints to, on how to escape the bullies. And in order for the participants to have a deeper understanding in the life of the victim, we have, had, we have hired victims to share their past experience. I'm not going to share too much details here today or else it will be challenging. So I hope that you're able to experience yourself. Up next, I would like to show you a video of the victim sharing. So this is a this is a brief overview on what we did. We arranged two trial runs in the past summer. The feedback was very positive. Over 250 students participated in the workshop, and what made us thrilled was that 80% of the participants indicated they will not become a bully or a bystander. They found our workshop inspiring and innovative. We invited participants to write an encouragement card to the victims in the last session with the social workers. At first, we didn't think that they would actually do it, but it turned out they did. Many of the cards written were very encouraging and really cheered the victims up. All in all, if there is a chance in the upcoming years, we are looking forward to promote our workshops to all schools in Hong Kong. We hope that we can raise more awareness on school bullying. Teachers, students, parents also play a part in this. Sink or swim, Bully Escape will give every ounce of our energy in this. So stay tuned. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andy, for making this happen. I think this is an issue that every one of us should be aware of. Um, so as I said, uh, David, think about how to house them in one of your premises, maybe. <laughs> so um, I think um, one of the leading icon, Donald Trump, has shown us I can spirit, definitely. But I think at, at the same time, without compassion, we can see many more problems. So I think what David's sections talked about, how to train um, the, the colleagues, the staffs, with more compassion, and also what Andy talked about is very important in changing our culture at the same time. I think it's not just about um, how we are building uh, the system itself. So uh, next, the youngest one. Again, it's not about the sequence here. <laughs> Hilary Yip, uh, but I think uh, she, is, uh, my daughter is also 13 years old. She's 13 years old, but her bio, you can read from the booklet, is uh, quite e equal size with uh, John Zhang. So, uh, so I think definitely Hillary got a lot to share with us. Thank you, Hillary. Good afternoon, everybody. So it's really great to be here today. And today I wanted to share a bit more about my story and what exactly I'm working on. So I started my business when I was 10 years old, after struggling with learning Mandarin for years. And I'll be honest, I was learning Mandarin for eight, seven, eight years, and I could barely string together a sentence. It got so bad that my mom decided to send my brother and I off to Taiwan for one month to improve our Chinese. So over there, we were in a summer camp. 
while we had no choice but to speak in Chinese and Chinese only. That meant that our Mandarin from, went from here to there instantly. And it's not even like we had a bad time doing it. We learned Mandarin and we actually applied what we learned through fun things like playing Kung Fu, like playing, playing all sorts of chess. And that really stuck with me. After I came back to Hong Kong, I came across a kids entrepreneurship challenge, which asked us to come up with an idea that we thought would change the world. I immediately thought of Taiwan. If I ask every single person in this room if at one point they've learned a second language, or if their children, if they have children, are learning second languages, I'm pretty sure that all of you would put your hand up, right? And yet the whole process is a pain. Here's why. When you learn a new language, between one class and the next, you have no opportunity to use it. And because of the way our brain works, within two days, if you don't utilize the knowledge, you lose 80% of it. That means that it's extremely frustrating if you learn for so long and yet you can't remember a thing. Furthermore, the current system, as mentioned earlier by, <laughs> by, um, by a lot of people, is that route learning is extremely difficult. And this sentiment has been repeated all over the world. That's why languages is so hard to deal with. My experience in Taiwan was great. For me, that was the best way to learn a new language. So I decided to bring this online so that kids everywhere can experience this without having to fly overseas pretty much every holiday to be able to get this experience. So I entered a program. Towards the end of the program, I was lucky enough to be able to pitch at the Venture Forum, which was a new event held by Start Me Up HK, which coincidentally is where I met Mr. Zhang when I was 10. I also met a lot of other people there, including my mentors, who continue to help me to this day. And, and after the program, I decided to um, take someone up on an offer for a meeting to see if there was any viable way to turn my idea into reality. During that meeting, my mentor sat us down and told me that building a startup is daunting, that the failure rate is high, but it is doable. He walked me through the entire process, from starting out with an idea to eventually IPO. And that let me know that doing a startup isn't impossible. It isn't something that will pop up overnight or will take years and years and years of extremely hard labor but it's something that can be done step by step and something that can be used to make a change quickly. During the next few months, we decided to do a bunch of trials. We got kids off Facebook to try, our dif try different iterations of our idea. And once we were happy with what we set out to achieve, we decided to build an MVP after partnering with a local company in Hong Kong. So right now we've got a beta version of our app on the App Store. And it was then when I realized that Minor Minus was so much more than just languages. On our app, we've got kids from more than 50 countries worldwide. And none of them knew each other initially. And yet, once they are on the app, you see them finding common ground, whether it's through talking about things like school, whether it's about talking th about things like their previous experiences with bullies. You're seeing people come together worldwide. And that's when I realized that it, Minor Minus has the power of connecting kids worldwide to make change. At the time, I was also interested in politics. And I realized that the world is a very divided place. Whether it's racism, which is more prevalent worldwide now, whether it's things like political beliefs, Hong Kong is a pretty divided place as a result of that, or even cultural things that set us apart. It's an issue that is so hard to deal with. And I think that the quote earlier by Gandhi is right. To make a change, we need to start with kids. Adults, no offense to any of you here, are very set in their ways. And if you've got a belief, it's extremely hard to convince someone otherwise. So that's why Minor Minus wants to start with kids. The other thing is, the world is essentially connected. Whether it's through Facebook or other social media, Adults all have somewhere to get together, but kids don't have that either. So that's what Minor Minus hopes to do. 
to connect kids worldwide, to give them a space on the internet for, them, for themselves, to find somewhere where we can expose kids to new ideas, new people, new cultures early on, so that we're more tolerant in the future and we're more empathetic, we are more sympathetic to people and their different beliefs. That's what Minor Minus hopes to achieve. And in the next year, we're trying to get onto Android web to fully utilize the power of the internet and to be able to access kids in a way that has been rarely been seen before through Minor Minus. And, that's, and when we're talking about building a happier society, if we're able to bring kids together to talk, to learn together, and to build, make a change together, that's what I think will make the world a happier place and a better place. Thank you. Thank you, Huey. And um, I, I changed my clothes. <laughs> I always think that um, innovation is like a tang or a local restaurant. You have to cook good food, but at the same time, you have to sustain the business at the same time. So I think, uh, may I invite all the panelists uh, back on the stage, including Kiran, for uh, uh, discussions here. I call it a uh, social innovation cafe here. Please. I'm a servant today. Uh, <laughs> please, please come on stage. <laughs> I'll take this seat, uh, so please feel free. Do we set an order of each? <laughs> you start first. <laughs> Always. <laughs> uh, okay, just a free seat. No age sequence, please. <laughs> so uh, I think uh, the whole panel deserves a big round of applause, please. So I think I would say um, two of them, the younger ones, uh, provide us with a lot of inspirations for, of Hong Kong. Uh, new ideas, new approaches, uh, brave approaches. Uh, two of, two of the, the other persons are influential persons in Hong Kong. They could change Hong Kong, basically. So I think uh, we, we got a very interesting combination here. But just to begin with, I would like to have um, Kiran. Uh, maybe you can respond to uh, what you hear about in the last uh, four talks. Uh, what they do, uh, what impresses you, and uh, what do you think about oh, uh, how they can improve their work or how that related to uh, what you think about on education or social innovation? Well, I think in, in the conversations with the adults, um, a lot of it was expressing the idea of where we are today at, at, a, at a larger level. And I, we were talking earlier that the world is struggling from a crisis of compassion. And that is globally. Uh, we are um, getting more fearful of each other. And in this otherism, we recognize that now it's coming back right to our children and our schools. And if you look at the March for Our Lives that happened in the US uh, earlier, we're talking about now children realizing that enough now. You know, if, if we adults uh, are, are incapable of sitting down and having a conversation built on empathy, then we will have to start taking those calls as well. And I think the beauty of a child is the idea of being nimble. Uh, like um, we talked about the fact that, you know, bureaucracy doesn't come in the way of an idea. And, uh, and I think children are now recognizing that they don't have to go through a bureaucratic process uh, to be able to take an idea from inception to implementation. Uh, I think technology has able to demo democratize so much of it. And I can, like for instance, if Hillary is saying I can do an app in MVP, God, I didn't even know what these words were. You know, so uh, I think it's an exciting time. Uh, uh, to be young, to be uh, creative. Um, and I think the only um, uh, tension is the idea of wisdom as well as passion. And I think for me that's a, that's a good tension to always have. One in, th in the throes of passion should not remove wisdom. And I think somewhere uh, we might have a tension in that space. Great. The wisdom of passion. It's very important. So I, I would say it's a huge privilege that for children can um, study at Riverside School <laughs> or have a chance to have a taste about, about the DFC. But I think I have to say, uh, most of the sh uh, students might not have this, this kind of privilege, especially at the um, existing education system. So I, my question is to uh, John first, maybe. Uh, how do you think about, uh, we still have to make a difference within the system. So uh, with your experience with the uh, establishment, how you think the difficulty would be, and uh, any chance that we can break through the system 
or at least uh, we say tangle with the system? Uh, well, I, I think what we need to do is really to sort of take control of our own lives. Uh, I mean, the, the, the bureaucracy is like a huge aircraft carrier. Uh, for, for that to turn around, it, it takes a long time. Uh, and, and, it, and there are a lot of resistance in, in, in the bureaucracy I mean, to, to sort of make a dent in the status quo. It's not an easy thing to do. So I think, especially now, people are looking to the civil society to effect changes in our society. The, the leadership is in, is in the third sector. Right? It's, it's, not, uh, it's, it's no longer uh, in, in the other place, but a lot, a lot of it is in stalemate, and it's really not pushing forward. So I think we need to, to look to ourselves. I don't think we, we need to be very ambitious to change the world, but I think if we could change a small slice at a time, uh, by bringing that, that together, I think we can make a lot of difference. Start small, try to crack it with the small things, right? Uh, so David, uh, talking about big little things now. <laughs> so I think I also get to know that David uh, got involved with a lot of uh, higher educations uh, as well. So uh, how do you think about educations? With, if there is uh, one thing that you can make a difference in education, yeah. What would that be? And can that relate to anything about um, big little things as well? I think education is a big system, as uh, Joint pointed out rightly. I think we shouldn't be relying on the system alone. I think as parents or as friends, um, I think we can do a lot. We, instead of relying and taking on whatever is uh, given to them. So you got to be very proactive. You got to, you know, reach out uh, such that you know what's the world, the real world. It's about like what Kieran, you know, let the kids experience what the real world is, uh, and then let them share the experience. So I think uh, I think there needs to be uh, reform, you know, to the school system, and parents can form advocacy groups or. Um, helping groups, helping each other, uh, instead of relying on the government. The government can only do so much, uh, uh, given you know, its resources and, and bureaucracy. I think uh, it needs to be uh, done hand in hand. Right. So I think um, um, for Andy, uh, bullying starts uh, in the system, in the classrooms. So how do you think, um, why is uh, a lot of these uh, things happening? I would say increasingly more uh, serious situations in Hong Kong on bullying. Um, how do you think that um, uh, uh, that could happen? And then what, what kind of things, uh, apart from your actions right now to influence people, how do you think that um, the system itself on the education on schools can, can, can do more in uh, solving this uh, bullying uh, issue? Um, well, I think students nowadays um, bully because Actually, I think they don't really understand what is bully or f um, fun and play, because they, um, I think it is about their curiosity. Um, they, cu they are curious about what 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 consequences th they will have when they play in this way or doing something that may hurt to others, and this leads to bully. And the reason why we chose the current way to. Uh, tackle the bully because as students ourselves, we ought to know more about uh, social this kind of social issues and this create a bigger impact, uh, create a bigger ability to form a uh, bigger impact on this consequence, on this issue. I think before I, I go to Hillary, I think I would like to uh, Kieran to also talk about these issues because I think it's a very important one. Yeah. How do you see that? Uh, how that happened? Parents or the society no, no, no. get impressions uh, that? Well, let me kind of kind of frame his uh, uh, the concern. Um, you know, so much of uh, the work that we do, or we this. Okay, let me frame it this way. Um, in education, you're you're told what to do, right? And and that's really what at the heart of what we are we are as a society struggling from the fact that for 15 years if I'm told what to do then I, I, when I'm like an adult you kind of wonder boss where's your opinion right so the idea even of project-based learning would often be coming into the class and saying okay children let us talk about global warming okay so it will be an adult issue that is brought into the classroom uh, and children will do their so-called 
you know, choreograph the movements and uh, uh, make it happen. I think with Design for Change, what happened was it, it offered the act of listening to children. We, said, we, we just walked in and said, what is it that bothers you? And what came out was not global warming, right? And whilst that might be a real issue and it'll come to them later on, what came out was bullying across the world. It was the biggest concern that children are telling us. They're scared. They're scared in schools. And we're telling them, you must do quadratic equations. And they're saying, I'm scared. And what also came out was where they, there were five areas where they were most scared with. One was the bathrooms of schools, right? And the bathrooms of schools, in off, unfortunately, most of our architecture places bathrooms in corners of school buildings. And very often those corners are dark, not lit very well, and it's a ripe space for, for bullying. The other is the corridors of schools. Because people realize that the moment there was a free period or between periods, the teachers would rush into a staff room and close the door. So it was completely unmanned. The transport, the, the uh, play areas, and finally now cyberbullying. So if we are getting this data, imagine the ability to transform even architecturally schools that are safer, emotionally safer for children. And I think that's what we, we have to be bold about. We're getting this data, children are talking to us and telling us we're scared, and we're telling them, no, 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 you must get your marks. So what he's picking up is a really, really important issue. And Hindley shared earlier on that one of the concerns she was having was that as well, bullying. We have to really get our act together. As a society, it can't be more about the exam, the results, all of that. It really has to go back to emotional safety of a child in a space. Yeah, thank you very much. So Hilary, you want to um, respond to that as well? Um, I would like to respond to bullying because a lot of times kids are doing it maliciously. You know, actively going against someone because maybe they're different or something. Because I personally left school last year due to bullying getting slightly out of proportion for me. And I would respond to the idea that the best way to solve it is kind of hard to achieve. Because even if we just go for experiential spaces or even if we just talk to people on how to solve the architecture, I believe that we just need an approach that is able to encompass all the different groups as opposed to dealing with just one. So that's my own take on it. Well, I think uh, definitely Hillary um, her family is also here. I think it's a, uh, definitely, I would say Hillary is an outlier. Uh, so my question to Hillary is, uh, how can you be an outlier? So uh, how, where is the optimism coming from? What, what, what your families, your parents doing right to you in your journey in, in life um, uh, that make you can uh, do something yourselves, starting up some startup uh, since 10 years old, and how you get through all the things, um, uh, even though there are some, some uh, bad situations happening. So. Um, to start with, I'd like to acknowledge that my parents are um, different in their own way. So my mom has been a notorious rebel her entire life. <laughs> so I think that that's brought on a less of a fear of being scared of being an outlier because inspiration comes from my mom. <laughs> and of course, they've been extremely supportive for everything I've been up to. So I guess that's the best thing I've gotten from my parents, support and the the lack of fear of being an outlier. I've learned through my experiences that being different is something to be valued as opposed to something that should be hidden away from other people. I think we should all encourage uh, Hillary's parents here. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So I think I would like to um, open the floor right now. So if, uh, if there are any, any questions um, coming from the floor. Hiran. Uh, because I, I, we have a lot of uh, people from your country, and uh, you can see there are a lot of Indian movies, and I'm a fan of uh, Khan, you see? <laughs> uh, but the, the problem with uh, us is that uh, we are always not the one who speed up, like Trump. You know, Trump can say anything he likes. Uh, but uh, we just uh, keep, uh, uh, just uh, have to uh, uh, be quiet because uh, of money. We we have money problem. I, I don't want to to uh, ignore the reality. We have money problem. We have uh, land problem. We have people problem. Too much people, and uh, and also. Uh, 
uh, I have experience of go, go to Europe. The people there, I try to get a teacher, but they don't understand me. Uh, I mean, even when I am educated in Hong Kong, uh, the teacher, also Indian, they teach us English. But actually, I, I, I'm from Good Hope School. Uh, the nuns, they don't understand us. <laughs> they are from Canada. Uh, so I, I go to uh, UK and then uh, my family also there. But uh, I don't think they understand too much also. Uh, when I go to uh, France, even worse. It, 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 it seems that the nuns, the, the, the nuns they, they are educators. They, they, don't have, uh, they don't have to put on uh, the ropes. They, they uh, work in prison, in schools. They teach people French. But the thing is, I really uh, don't want to uh, 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 be uh, uh, machines for, uh, for them to make money uh, wearing makeup, uh, fashion. That's what Paris do. So, uh, and... Um, I, we, we don't solve the problem, uh, even my experience. Uh, they, they come to Hong Kong very happy, but not, not us. We still uh, cannot uh, have to, we are different. We don't have uh, sometimes to worry about money. They, they don't worry about money, they are very happy. And we, we worry about our teacher, they have all the teachers, all the people I met, they, they get PhD, uh, doctor, and, but, but the thing, uh, people so uh, 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 professors, they don't understand me. Even they are professors. I think, uh, I think we understand. So I, 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 I don't understand uh, uh, how you can uh, have all the schools uh, <laughs> educate people. It seems that we have the best teachers, but they, they cannot teach us. And they... I, yeah, I, I think many people share the same similar experience with you. So I think, thank you very much. So uh, Kiran, can you respond to that? I, I'm not quite sure what I have to respond to. I mean, the fact <laughs> that, uh, that people don't understand you, yeah. and, well, they don't understand me also. <laughs> I, I'm not quite sure what the question is. Um, how, did the school, how, do I, how did we reach so many schools? Maybe I'll twist it to um, um, when you are designing Riverside School. Actually, some of the questions asked about the. Uh, no, I don't think the question is. I think mm. about Riverside School. I think it's it's the idea is that how uh, how to have. I I I I'm I'm paraphrasing and correct me if I'm wrong. But I think you're asking um, how did this become a global movement? I mean, how. how do you overcome, uh, the barrier? Oh, okay. For language. Uh, are you asking in my school or are you asking through Design for Change? Because yes, it is, but we don't. Uh, uh, we teach um, English. I mean, English is the uh, is the medium of instruction, and then we teach one Indian language that is Hindi. Shah Rukh Khan loves that. A uh, third language, actually, we don't have. Yes. Sure. In fact, uh, there are lots of schools in India that have four four languages. Okay. Okay. No. So, yes. So we've had it a little easy, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I'll um, turn it back to John because uh, a lot of people want to know more about Esperanza. So uh, you got some airtime now. <laughs> uh, well, Esperanza is a new organization. Uh, what uh, we have started our first module is in education. Uh, and then for, for, from there, we can look into other aspects. But uh, education to us is probably the, the most, uh, is the thing with the, the greatest urgency in, in Hong Kong. Uh, as I have mentioned before, I think the, our curriculum is way, way out, out of date. I mean, it's, uh, it's from an industrial age, trying to train uh, students uh, to become something that would not exist uh, in the 21st century. So we, we, we need to identify alternatives. We need to identify people with, with passion in, in, in this area who would drive changes from, from, from within. Uh, Esperanza on its own would not be able to do that by ourselves, but we uh, we're happy to be the platform to, 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 to work with the different 
civic organizations uh, to, to collaborate with you to, to push forward the things that, uh, that, that you're interested in. And we have seen a lot of uh, different organizations with uh, good, noble uh, objectives. Uh, we have worked with Teach for Hong Kong for a while and uh, a lot of the alternatives uh, are, are the kind of that, that, that we, are, we, are, we are looking for and we are working with that. But I think a, a, another aspect that, that we, we would like, like to work on is really the, um, the mismatch uh, in, 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 in the school with the, the, the corporate world. Uh, a lot of my friends in the corporate world tells me that they are looking for people that don't exist. Uh, and in, in the schools, we are not training uh, or pro providing the kind of education that, that, that the kids need to, to be effective uh, in the world. So there, there's a mismatch there. And we want to identify the specific mismatches and provide opportunities for these learnings to take place and so, so, so that we would be able to accommodate the gaps that would exist, that, uh, that will exist. Uh, very, very shortly. Thank you, thank you. Um, I think um, apart from uh, Teach for Hong Kong, now you know two more in Hong Kong, right? <laughs> so Andy, uh, many people would like to get to know your motivations. What <laughs> motivates you? And I would say, I'll take the chance to say, um, finding an innovations to a, uh, a new approaches is not easy. So by the time that you are setting up this before that, uh, have you think about any other ways in dealing with the bullying issues? Uh, why you decided at the end with uh, the current solutions? Well, um, we decided this current um, solution because um, we wanted students to really uh, feel what bully is and not just listening to speakers or lectures that um, what bully is, but to feel and actually uh, make their own experience on it. And in this to uh, raise the awareness on um, school bullying and the difference between play and bully. So, um, yeah, your motivations, why you started, you, you've been bu bullied or you bully someone um, before? Actually, <laughs> uh, actually I, um, some of my co-founders are actually bullied in the past years. And this is also one of the reason, reason why we want to start this bully escape to tackle this problem. Thank you. So, uh, Hillary, back to you. So, I think um, starting is not easy at the age of 10. So, uh, I think the uh, same questions would be why you think about the current approach by that time. And uh, would there be any obstacles that are uh, quite obvious it would be at the, at the very beginning? If there are some change makers uh, on this, uh, down, down there would like to start something, what would you be your advice to them as well? Um, so, when I got started, my main goal was to connect people together to learn languages from e each other at the time. And I guess that the challenges when we were getting started was to work out exactly how to get started. And one thing I recommend to anyone who <coughs> plans to start a business would be take the first step. That's the most important thing of doing something. Because you can listen to all the lectures you want, you can listen to as many panels as you want, you can read as many books as you want, but if you don't take that first step, it will just never happen, no matter what you do. So take the first step and um, try talking to other people in the startup world to work out what you can do and how. Yeah, hey, um, Kieran, you keep on smiling. <laughs> she looks like one of your students, right? <laughs> so um, what about you? Your motivations and... Um, um, your my motivation when I was 10 was just to have as many french fries as I could. <laughs> so, uh, no motivation. Um, but uh, for me, like, I had no plans to change the world. <laughs> uh, my whole world changed when I became a mother. So, my motivation was that of a mother. So, I keep saying I'm first a mother, then a designer, and then possibly an educator. That comes really far back. So, I think it was really that personal... Uh, uh, relationship and with education that happened just because my son experienced it. it for me, it's very personal. Uh, it, it wasn't a grand idea that, you know, or a social entrepreneurship workshop, etc. So it was personal. And I think design thinking gives you one powerful uh, ability. It, says, it tells you that you are who you've been waiting for. 
And I think that's at the heart of the I can mindset. It is, the world doesn't owe you anything. They're not going to come and change your life if you're unwilling to be part of that story. So for me, and it was not about, and I think I resonate with Hillary, it was not about changing education. It was changing my son's story. So I bit off exactly what I could chew. And, uh, and I think I had the luxury of time on my hands so I could do it a year at a time, but it was pretty much that, a motivation of a mother. I start my own organizations um, since my uh, children born as well. So I think partly because of them. So uh, I think a lot of uh, you find common about the innovations that uh, questions that you ask is thing, it will be quite about uh, your personal experience, things happening around you, or uh, your own um, missions about something as well. So I think back to David, I think um, we talked about collaborations. Some people think that oh, um, the innovation culture or change culture is not that good. How do you observe right now overall Hong Kong and how can we induce more collaborations? Among different uh, sectors? It, it really depends. Uh, I think if you want to innovate, you innovate. You don't have to wait for you know, um, the success to happen. You have to you know, believe in yourself and uh, you know, plan your own future. It's like the corporate world, you know, after a while, uh, you find success. It's a, a repeating pattern. It's very boring. So. Finally, we decided that, hey, by giving, and you find passion, you find more satisfaction than just the dollar and cents. So I think uh, just NGOs or CSR, you need to keep innovating. You know, new ways of doing charities, new ways of doing philanthropies. So there, there are a lot of things that we can innovate, our own lives, changing the lives of others. Uh, bit by bit, it does not have to be, you know, big step forwards. And little step add together, you are making bigger steps. Great, great. So uh, I don't think I can finish all these questions. But today we got a very innovative uh, arrangement. Uh, actually, after the section, all those speakers will stay behind. Uh, some of them with a separate section. Some of them will be uh, in this room. So you can uh, feel free to come to have a longer conversation with them. But uh, before ending the sections. I would, I would like to um, 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 demand all of you to end with one line. It's about how you think about um, education. So uh, can we start with Andy? You got a lot of friends uh, uh, asking questions here. So you got the airtime here first. Many people like you. Uh, they, they basically say you're cool, you're handsome, uh, you <laughs> <laughs> things like that. So, uh, Andy, education, one line, what would that be? One word, if you prefer. Stop bullying. <laughs> Good. He knows what is advertising. <laughs> David. Uh, every day is a learning opportunity. Great. So, uh, for every one of us, uh, no matter where, where we are. Learn how to learn. Oh, learn how to learn. Good. Kieran. You only have today. Make it matter. It's that again. Thank you. Education is something you take into your own hands. Wow. Thank you. Oh, I got my airtime as well. Um, I would say I would like to end with uh, we still have hope. No matter how depressed you feel, no, ma no matter how helpless you, you think about, uh, let's do something. Uh, today, don't end this like uh, seeing a touching movie. Take something away. Uh, just one takeaway. Do one thing more uh, differently tomorrow to change our system. We only have today. today. Yes. Definitely. Thank you very much. <laughs> and big round of applause to all the panelists here. So uh, may I also invite um, Rebecca back on stage uh, with a group photo. Uh, also, souvenir first. I'm sorry. Yes. Rebecca is our chair of the Social Enterprise Summit. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So we start with that, that end, the most handsome one over there. Uh, by handsomeness, now the sequence is, no, 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 John is handsome as well. <laughs> oh, oh, I got that wrong. Thank you. So uh, let's have a group photo. Uh, we'll invite um, all of us over here. 
Yes, uh, we got a few more photos, actually. Uh, let me see. Uh, Ellen, please come on stage as well. Jane, please come on stage. The chairman of SESI Fund and is the chair of uh, HKSEF. OC members, uh, please. Other speakers, sponsors, advisors, seemingly everyone. <laughs> so if you feel that you are on stage, please come on stage. <laughs> Like uh, and look happy as 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 if we have already have a happier society. Yes. <laughs> uh, we just had the Greater Bay Area Social Innovation Forward Looking Forum before lunch, and then we had very heated discussions. Uh, everybody are talking about the challenges that we are facing, and we have decided to act together as one entity and lead the social innovation movement forward. So as a result, just over lunchtime, with, within less than 45 minutes, we have come up with an advocacy. And this advocacy is being led in, by Hong Kong. So it's called the Greater Bay Area Social Innovation Advocacy Hong Kong. Because I just have the Chinese transcript here, so I just quickly translate it into English. Because all the participants, including uh, 12 platform organizations, educational institutes, incubation centers, and a few social enterprises who were at the forum uh, at lunch, uh, before lunchtime, we agree that the Greater Bay Area needs a professional, transparent, closely knitted, and fair working network. So as the first step, we hope we could um, lead this movement throughout the entire Bay Area led by Hong Kong. And based on this, we will have, um, we'll come together, we take actions, uh, we build up mechanisms, and also we'll build up common concepts. And these, uh, we will collaborate with each other with division of labor and provide sustainable development in the Greater Bay Area. So we would accumulate resources from different sectors of the society and enlarge this movement. And we hope to nurture every citizen to come up with innovative solutions to improve our society. And we would develop innovative solutions that is appropriate to the Bay Area. And also together, together, social data, social impact statistics, and best practices within this area. So there are 12 organizations, including the following. So they are just uh, in random order, including the Hong Kong Social Enterprise Summit uh, from Sun Jun. I don't think they have an English name, sorry, because I don't only have the Chinese version, so I just read out the English name, uh, the Chinese name from Sun Jun. Uh, from Guangzhou, Guangzhou Shehui Chuang Xin Zhong Xing, and then from Samjun, the Philanthropy Institute, Samjun Guo Ji Gong Yi Xue Yuan, and from Shun De, Shun De Chu Shehui Chuang Xin Zhong Xing, and then um, the Zhuhai branch of the Beijing. Sifan Daxue, the Beijing uh, Teachers University. Beijing Sifan Daxue, Zhuhai Fen Xiao, Song Qingling Gong Yi Qi San Jiao Yu Zhong Xing. And then First Response, a social enterprise from Beijing now in Sumzhen. And also a social enterprise from Guangzhou, Zhi Gen Liao Wu Zhang Ai Chu Xing. And also Shenzhen Shi, from Samjun, also Se Chuang Xin, Se Hui Qi Ye Fa Zhan, Chu Jin Zhong Xin. And also social enterprises from Hong Kong, um, the Feng Shen, Se Hui, Xue Hui, Xie Qi Xue Hui, Education for Good, Ren Ren Xue Xue, Hai You Rong Ju Li, Inclusive Impact. So pardon my translation, it's very tardy translation, but it's just hot off the press. And I would like to invite representatives from these 12 organizations to come up on stage and we sign on this piece of paper. Uh, and uh, I would invite all of you to be witnesses 
to the signing of this advocacy and let's work in unity with one heart to make the, bet, uh, the Bay Area a better area for everyone. So, uh,请所有我们刚才在台湾去讨论的发起机构,请所有的代表一起上来,然后我们签署这个文件。请夏璇,请夏璇,还有贾珍,贾珍老师,其他的老师都请你们上来吧。Shall we sign sit there? Because so please, everyone, be our witness. And then we will work together and grow this network together. I read, some, uh, I read from some historical examples. Many great movements are being scribbled on a piece of paper, some on a piece of handkerchief, some on a piece of uh, uh, serviette. Uh, and I hope this paper will bear witness to this day and that Hong Kong and the other 10 cities in the Bay Area we will promote social good. And from there, we hope to influence places beyond the Bay Area, including the One Belt, One Road. Aki, uh, are you Tom Tom? Tom Tom, So I'd like to ask Jane to stay behind because as you all know, Jane is one of the most prominent social entrepreneurs in Hong Kong and she is the founding chair of Social Enterprise Summit. So taking this opportunity, I'd like to ask her to let us know more about her journey as a social entrepreneur. Jane, please. Well, hi Rebecca, I'm not a social entrepreneur. I wouldn't claim this credit. Um, but, uh, I'm so glad to see the Social Enterprise Summit growing and uh, been so successful um, for the past 11 years and after you take taken up the leadership, it's even getting better. Um, but um, looking back is actually very interesting. Um, 11 years ago when I um, decided to start the summit, um, it was actually started with the government's Social Enterprise Summit. So it is in English, in Chinese without the characters Mangan, non-government. And um, a, a very good friend of mine, um, who's not here now, um, inspired me to set up a non-government social enterprise summit. And so that's how we started. And with this concept, we started uh, with Francis and a number of us now here together, uh, a, a group of 10 organizations together to start the social enterprise summit in 2008. And at that time, I was an academic. That's why it was nat very natural for you know, people like us working in the university to set up conferences to learn from the new concepts worldwide and invite overseas speakers learning from them. But then very quickly, I found that this is the future of Hong Kong. This, these are the solutions. They are available everywhere, but not yet in our community. And therefore, the Social Enterprise Summit has been actually building up with um, by inviting experts from various parts of the world to share with us. And I, in fact, I'm very glad to see that over the years, a lot of local initiatives have been coming up. And um, coincidentally, I was um, asked to join um, my current organization, which is the Singkong Welfare Council 
uh, which is a very large NGO in Hong Kong. And at that time when I joined it in 2011, you remember many of our social entrepreneurs complained that NGOs are very anti-innovative. And um, when I joined this big organization, I found, oh yes, partially it is true. Uh, but then what I need to do is to change it. And I'm very glad to tell you that my organization, my colleagues, um, some of them are here now, my colleagues are actually very innovative um, by crossover uh, many of the ideas that they want to do because they have the passion for the clients that they are serving. So it's a matter of passion that is important. And then they are given the space, they are given the opportunities, and they would innovate. Um, and then I, I was asked to take up the SIE fund July this year, which is a government fund. And uh, with this experience of um, encouraging cross-sector collaboration, as you, you shared just now, this is one of the very typical examples uh, of this panel. We had a former government senior official, we have young people, we have business people, and with this kind of um, combination and crossover, then we can jam new ideas. And so by taking up this fund as the chair, I hope I'm not just another administrator that approved the funding proposals. And um, I, I really hope that um, in the years to come, I can see this fund is um, not just providing a platform to incubate um, the startups, but also encourage more flexibility in the bureaucracy by providing um, the funding which would facilitate the intermediary as well as the fundy, rather than just monitoring and controlling. And so I hope every of you would support my initiative and work together with me to make this happen. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you very much, Jing. I think um, whether you're from social enterprises or from other sectors or the society, we all hear what Jane said, and uh, I believe that the SIE Fund will act as a catalyst for social innovation to flourish in Hong Kong. And before I finish, I should congratulate you once again um, for taking the leadership of the Social Enterprise Summit and make this another level of success. Thank you very much. Rebecca. My pleasure. Thank you very much, Jane. So um, this is the closing ceremony. So I would like to take this chance to thank all the speakers and facilitators for your excellent facilitations and summaries, and as well as the presentations. Um, I'm sure those of you who are at the opening ceremony will hear that Ashoka, the well-renowned social entrepreneurship driver, they have set up a base in Hong Kong from which they would develop um, the Asian market. And uh, Mark, is Mark here? Mark, the Managing Director of Ashoka Europe, now Ashoka Asia, has announced the award given to two uh, Ashoka Fellows. So one being David Young of Green Monday, and the other being uh, Scott Stiles of the uh, Free Employment Foundation. So congratulations to all of them, and it's indeed, uh, we feel very proud of them, and it's very encouraging news for Hong Kong and also for the rest of Asia. So this year, our theme is Innovating for a Happy Society, and over the discussions, we found that this is the ultimate goal of all kinds of social innovation. Uh, it is a very important one because this is why we are all here. But it is increasingly clear that economic growth does not necessarily bring about human growth or meaningful growth. I'm not saying that economic growth is not important. It is very important to modern society, but it's just that they are not bringing about the change that we would like to see, and many things are not being improved. So as social entrepreneurs, um, we have bought into perspectives how business and investment can work together for social good, how art and design can lead to meaningful social change, as well as the development of inclusive solutions, compassion, which are all, all important elements in determining the quality of life of people. So I hope that the objective of happiness will also be the objective of the government uh, of Hong Kong and of other countries. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank all our cooperators, our sponsors, our co-organizers, partners, and every one of you, of, of you who are being here to support this event. Without you, this submit would not have been successful. 
Last but certainly not the least, I would like to say a big thank you to the Secretariat, led by Susan, Summer, Ava over there at the panel, Ophelia, Mike, the only gentleman in our group, and Miller, where are you? And many helpers, Pinky, many of them are outside. Uh, a big applause for them for, because they have been working incredibly hard over the last few months to make everything happen. And also to our organizing committee members here for your participation, your suggestions, and the networks that you have brought into the Social Enterprise Summit. So uh, I would like to thank all of you for coming this afternoon. Hope to see you again next year. And we have tea and coffee here, so feel free to connect with each other and also um, to talk to the speakers. They are all here. So that's why we have the photo, the group photo first, so that after that you could talk until 6, 7 o'clock. So see you. Thank you. Uh, pass the mic back to Francis. Uh, thank you, Rebecca. So uh, one more time, big applause to the organizing team and Rebecca and all the OC. So uh, uh, it's not the end of the sections. There is one more uh, open space section. We will keep uh, bothering Kiran on another room. It's a room 423 to 424. I think we will now, uh, we have a bit of delay, so we might start around five to 10 minutes maybe. So I think uh, Arnold and Timothy is going to facilitate that on a topic called how to empower youth uh, to innovate for a happier society. Uh, but for the other panelists, actually they will stay for a bit uh, here for coffee and tea. I can grab a coffee with you. <laughs> work, you have to work. <laughs> you can, you can. <laughs> and then um, they will stay here for uh, a bit of network with you. And also at the same time, we got a free space. We got um, ADAM artists uh, to do some co-creation with us uh, in this room. And also there are some social innovation exhibitions outside the room. So in case you drop by or uh, passing through, uh, go to say hi to all those change makers. So Rebecca. Why don't we all stay in this room? So that I, I'm sure many people would like to talk to all the speakers. So don't take, bring Kiran away. Oh, uh, so okay. okay, Kiran, no work now. Okay, you can stay here with a coffee. <laughs> so thanks, Rebecca. So everyone, just stay in the room. We got a closey combination today. So uh, everyone staying here. No more sections in another room. So Timothy and Arnold will be facilitating us over here. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Take something back with you and do something. Thank you. <laughs>